to. So well, it, that's the way I've always but, seen it. Yeah, but this is a tunnel, you know, Black Orpheus is sort of reminding me of... Uh, <laughs> this is a portal. It's a portal. The- yeah, it is. And so you think of it as a pond, but if you think about what you see when you look at a pond, you don't ever see, unless you're a drone flying over. That's what I am. <laughs> Fort Louis. Fort Louis. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And and I noticed later. Oh, this does appear in those other paintings. This pond thing. Yes. Like in the red table. It it appears in a lot of places. I didn't realize that until this moment. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're telling me? Well, it, you know, it is funny that uh, uh, seeing the retrospective, all of a sudden I go like, oh, that's red and white, and that's red and white, and oh, look, there's the pond, and there's the, you know, so. Well, the portal is a theme. Yes, I didn't and, realize how much so, yeah. yeah. I, where is it? I want to know where it's going to port me to. Do you have any idea? <laughs> Well, to some primordial place. I mean, you're walking into a cave, and that's why it makes, reminds me of Black Orpheus, because that is what, oh. in the film of Black Orpheus, they're walking down through this cave that, it, that is much darker than this, but is, looks oh, like this. Oh, I've got to go back and see that movie again, because that was really an important movie for me. But I haven't watched it in years. Makes me want, I didn't. I didn't remember about the cave. I think it's relevant to what we're talking about, so we'll have to watch. It. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Don't you think? absolutely. The primordial. Yeah. Well, this, yes, I had to. Uh, I wanted to sell this painting because I need to do that every now and again. And so I thought, oh, if I just get rid of those little ghost-like things, I think people might like it a little better. It might make more, you know, sense to them. I love them. Oh, do you? Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe I can paint them back, but it relied on the white of the paper. You know, to be a watercolorist, you're not supposed to put Chinese white on the white paper, you know, if you're a traditionalist at all, and I'm less and less so, but... But they look cuddly, you know, they look like a, a baby doll with a, a, a blanket. Oh! <laughs> or, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned that, because that was not my experience. Uh, I mean, uh, in an, another time. Yeah, no, but they, they're the kind of thing you could make, give a baby, and the baby would... <laughs> I wrap them in a blanket. Yeah. They have that little sweet cupy tail. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. I'm Greg Robinson. I'm the chief curator at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And it's a real honor to um, help host you for the third formal presentation that Linda has done with her retrospective here. And we each, um, all of these um, are videotaped and Um, will be up on YouTube for you to see as well, so you can let people know. Uh, I'm just here. I'm actually, I have some, uh, several volunteers who are helping to um, host you with the reception upstairs. There will be one thing about the reception, which is typically we don't allow a lot of food and drink upstairs, but all of Linda's watercolors are protected with plexiglass or glass, but the oil paintings aren't. And those are in the separate part, the beacon gallery towards the front. So you'll see a sign, the double glass doors, if you just please keep food and drink out of that area, will be uh, all set. And um, I just want to briefly, I think everyone knows Linda Okazaki. If you don't, she's here on your left. And... um, 
She, she's a little shy, but I'm sure with some crowd enthusiasm, we can get her talking. And, um, and Dr. Lisa Forlui Wood, and this is the second program that Lisa has helped us with. And we have a new lead in education and community engagement here at BEMA. It's um, Jenna Donna. And she will be taking uh, over the program in terms of Q&A. I'm going to go off on cheese and crackers duty. And um, Jenna will give the land acknowledgement also. And as chief curator, I'd like to say that the land acknowledgement isn't just something in writing that we do as, as a checklist these days, but the Suquamish tribe, our closest tribe, uh, whose land, ancestral land we're on, has been pivotal in advising and partnering and even funding three major indigenous artists exhibitions we have had in the last 10 years. And um, <laughs> we are uh, grateful, honored, and humbled for um, their growing friendship and participation in helping us to do a better job. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is within the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people of the clear salt water Suquamish people. Expert fishers, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's central Salish Sea, as they have for thousands of years. Here, the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters for their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. Okay. Linda and Lisa. I'm going to get us started. Uh, Linda and I have been in conversation in preparation for several months for this presentation today, and we picked three themes which we considered separate, but over time they've become very interactive and intertwined. One is historic references and conversations across time with artists. Secondly, eroticism in its varied forms from ecstatic to destructive and altered states and transformations, including personal, psychic, real, imagined, and primordial. Oh, <laughs> uh, goodness. <laughs> well, let's get started. Well, here we have studio conversation from 1985. You see a recognizable Van Gogh on the left and um, Galen Hansen on the right, uh, born in 1921. And so he's alive and well, and we'll be having a retrospective at Goods, uh, Woodside Braceth uh, this spring. So keep your eye out for that because uh, being 103, uh, that's really something. I think being an artist must be good for your health. <laughs> but during this time of 85, I had a two-year-old boy. And so my studio practice in the over, uh, uh, a remake of a garage, I had to grab uh, the moments during naps and whenever I could, and that was my... That was my practice and, and what I did conscientiously. But I so missed the studio conversations like we had in grad school or with a, a graduate seminar or teaching classes. And I was, so I uh, just made up conversations with, uh, you know, well, what about that last painting you did, Van Gogh? And, and um, <laughs> And, and Galen saying, well, yeah, I, I don't think the birds are quite right. You know, they could have been bigger. Or, um, but turns out it wasn't Galen's, well, it wasn't Van Gogh's last painting anyway. It turns out it was Roots. And I've been working on Roots lately. So um, th the conversation could continue. There could be a variation on this. <laughs> Um, Galen's 103, so he'd look a little different, but the painting behind could... Uh, anyway, yes, let's go to the next one. 
And here, uh, it continued at the same time of my having a conversation uh, with uh, dear Van Gogh. And I, here's my letter right here from 1985. That's what's up there. And um, it was just that... He had said in his letters, oh, I wish I'd been a beautiful blonde instead of an ugly Dutch man. I think it would have been so much better. But I thought, well, you know, it's kind of hard to, to control your time as a woman. You have lots of things you need to do of caring for the child and all of that. So well, why am I concerned about Van Gogh? Well, it's interesting that he's so well-liked. Um, around the world, what happened to him. And um, when I was in Provence in 1972, through the spring and summer, it stayed in my mind because it was the only time that I had such an experience of walking his streets and the roads and uh, went to the cafe and over the bridge and to Saint-Rémy and looked out at Mont Saint-Victoire and uh, went into Saint-Rémy and there was, that's where he went, uh, the insane asylum, I suppose it was called at that time. And there was this sunflower poster just tacked to the wall. And I, I expected something different. But when I looked out the window and saw Mont Saint Victoire, I thought, oh, it hasn't changed. He painted it perfectly right. And what's this business of thinking he was a crazy man? His draftsmanship and the way he captured the Mistral in the movement of the Cypress, well, there was intelligence in that. And that's what people love when they look at his work. You don't have to say anything about the Mistral. They see it and they get that information. And that's all in his drawings and everything else. And I thought, I'm so sorry that somehow I just got pulled into the idea that you were a crazy artist who cut off your ear. and That was not the story. That was not who he was. And I, I appreciate the, the more recent movie that depicted uh, his humanity uh, more realistically. So this is about my relationship to artists uh, historically and in the present and and throughout time and whenever I I have many drawings of artists that uh, from Balthus and Bonar and Matisse and Soraya and Edward uh, uh, Hopper and on and on in my sketchbooks. It's what I like to do. I like to go to museums, spend the day, choose something, and I choose it by my emotional response. And so when I first saw the Red Studio at MoMA 2001, I was just like, oh, this feels so good. And, uh, oh, you just have to show up at museums and experience these things. It's not the same as seeing an image in a book or even a projection. These don't uh, do justice. They're, it's not the same thing at all. But then, finally, in 2011, I had my, my thing of colored pencils in my bag that I take to MoMA or the Met and sit and draw. And so I, I drew the Red Studio. Uh, and had to go a couple of times, and that's with the colored pencils. And um, I, I got it. You know, you could see I, I figured out sort of the composition, the lines, and where they were placed. And uh, But then, 10 years later, or 12, whatever, yeah, I, 22 instead of 2011, I went, oh, MoMA had the Red Studio exhibition, uh, which had the painting from their collection, but also all of the objects that were in his painting were in that exhibit. So I went to MoMA for three afternoons, spending all afternoon uh, doing the iPad painting of this, uh, which uh, I could do at the scale, the actual scale of that piece, being an iPad painting. And, um, and so it was like, oh, oh, I love this, being able to do it. It, doesn't, it actually imitates 
uh, the colors that are in the original painting more clearly. And then the, the right hand uh, piece, it whipped me the same way that it did in that original drawing. And when what the eye sees, with our eye, you know, we have it all trained uh, to interpret what we're seeing out there according to the things that we have learned in our practice. And so if you're doing a cube, you've kind of learned what that was in, a, uh, in your practice, or a, a cylinder, you round the bottom, you don't make it flat, or so on and so forth. And, and when I was doing the chair, I just went, Oh, Matisse, you fooled me again. I had to keep erasing it. I couldn't get it because the eye wanted to do the convention of how I understood a chair to be. And I just stomped my foot and went, you fooled me again. Uh, you did the same thing. I just wanted to um, comment because we spent quite a bit of time talking about these paintings. But really what resonates for me is spending time with Linda in her studio which I had the privilege of doing several times and wandering around to the back side of the studio and seeing how many renderings of the Conference of the Birds she had, many, many paintings, and then looking at her collection of artifacts and seeing her pulling open the giant drawers and all the paintings that she stored, some of them in partial form and some of them complete. Um, and that having the feeling of moving around her studio and being able to feel what it's like to work in there uh, gave me a sense of your process that I couldn't get any other way. Yes, I remember that you said, well, you know, the studio is very active. And I said, oh, really? Active? You know, because it, they become invisible to you, what you have in there. You're just searching for what it is that you need at the moment. So that was uh, so many things that you've said of just kind of like, oh, well, that's interesting. It wouldn't occur to me. Well, and you also kept apologizing that it was messy. And you said, you know, I need to clean it up for people to come in here. But what people want to feel is a sense of your process and where things are and how you move. <laughs> so sort of, you know, what the body thinks is more of the issue in terms of going into the space. And I do think um, in some ways that happens when you're doing a rendering as you're entering that space also. Well, uh, funny that you mention what, what the body thinks because uh, the oil paintings that are in the, uh, uh, the entrance uh, up at the stairs, uh, they don't look like the watercolors. And uh, if one were really a technician, you could, in fact, uh, make the, wa the oil paintings uh, come up with the techniques so they imitated uh, the palette and everything that's on the watercolors. But the whole purpose for me with the oil painting is that I want the physicality. And because with wa the way I paint with the watercolor, I have to plan one color after the other. I have to stay within shapes. And there, there's not that energetic release that you can get with the oil. And so I'm just explaining why they, they don't look the same. It's the physical aspect of that process. Nice. Oh, the bridge in the rain. Um, this isn't in the exhibit because it's in L.A., but I have this in my bathroom uh, from the Okazaki family. And um, so over the course of, uh, since 1980, of uh, going over the Hood Canal Bridge, I've probably stopped at least 10 times uh, for the passage of the nuclear submarines who, they're over to this side, so small, you can barely identify it. And then it moves through, and it has to get all the way over here, so small that you can barely see it. And then you have free passage. And so it gave me plenty of time to think, well, you know, this, this shape really reminds me of that. And the Hood Canal Bridge kind of reminds me of that. 
And then there was another connection that this was one of the wood blocks that Van Gogh chose to do a variation on. So there's that kind of layering up of experiences that I try to bring into my work that informs me. But I'm also a downwinder from Hanford. Uh, you know, our family worked on the Manhattan Project. And we had the sirens that went off, and you had to, you didn't duck and cover, you ran home. Or, and if, and there was nobody at my home, my mother was dead. And uh, so that was really scary for me, because uh, nobody was going to be there when I ran home. And so that was, I don't know who came up with that program, but I don't think it was a very good one. <laughs> And because <laughs> uh, sirens uh, even now jar me, you know, because uh, uh, that, that was very scary. And then uh, now, you know, I have a, a second cousin's husband who's part of the cleanup, uh, and he is, uh, can only be in there for about one or two minutes. Uh, uh, and that's his day's work. And I've had... Uh, you know, four uh, cousins uh, from that area who were younger than me that uh, are, have deceased. And I was on the Downwinder uh, Committee for 15 years, and uh, we really ha held hope that we would uh, receive uh, medical compensation uh, from the release of, uh, of uh, the things that affected the thyroid for myself. But we, we were not successful. And of course, that's a, a, something that we don't really talk about in The Return of the Salmon. But I have my own poem about humans being as sensitive as fish. So after my Briarcliff series of friendly shrubs that I did in uh, July, a uh, private residency in the Briarcliff area. That's a part of uh, Seattle that's pretty ritzy, and uh, the uh, it looks toward uh, the ferry terminal right here. It's a great view of the atmosphere, the water, the water traffic, and the shrubbery really was one of the themes that I was really attracted to. And I just, uh, I called it a residency because that was the only way I could really secure and protect my time. And it was if I honored the residency program. And, uh, but uh, I, it was, uh, I thought what a great way to honor, I, well I saw the 24 passages of the ferry going from the Seattle Ferry Terminal to Barron Bainbridge and my son's house looked out directly in line to the Bainbridge Ferry Terminal so it was perfect way to honor uh, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art as being this little jewel for uh, the creative uh, aspects of the greater Puget Sound area. But the friendly shrubs really reminded me of my dear friend Robert Helm, who had been uh, my graduate uh, advisor and a dear friend and colleague when I was teaching. And he died unexpectedly uh, in 2008. And uh, so I thought, what a great way to honor Bob Helm, to have these imaginary conversations with him, which brought the shrubbery to life. I could have a, a conversation with these shrubs that some looked like poodles and others looked like houses. And they just, each one seemed to speak to the personality of the owner of the house. And you can see here, Helm had this man uh, with his shrub, and I I'd only had the picture, and then his daughter, Brenna Helm, told, I asked her for the name, and she says, oh, that's Thursday, it's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I didn't know that, but I picked this out, because when we visited the Palouse in September 22, after the uh, residency, I made a point to visit old friends like 
Tamara Helm, his wife, and his daughter, Brenna Helm. And they invited us to visit his studio. And I was mightily surprised and overwhelmed because I knew that the studio had been closed since his death of 2008, except for uh, the use of his fine woodworking uh, tools that his uh, son-in-law uh, uses as he's a fine woodworker. So everything was in place just as he left it. And um, I could go on and on about the many things in there, but we, we're going to try to not keep you here too long, so we'll, we'll move along here. But that was just a fantastic experience for me because it really did reconnect me to all those feelings of that deep relationship, friendship, and, and work. Um, and so this is a friendly shrub. And then uh, I was thinking, well, the, there could be a waterfall here, falling water. A reference to Frank Lloyd Wright. I want to just make a comment that this is an iPad oh, drawing. This and is an iPad painting, painting yeah. with watercolor on top of it. And that series of paintings that are upstairs in the gallery are the only things that I have available for uh, purchase. If it says courtesy of the artist, I didn't know this before the the uh, retrospective, but it means that you have the opportunity to make that part of your collection if you like. And that's true. <laughs> that's true for the poster. I made an edition of 50, and those are available for sale. Um, and marketing is my worst attribute. I haven't done a good job at all. But I'm mentioning it now because this is an opportunity for that. So. That wasn't my cue for a plug, but you did very well. <laughs> I um, am going to make my own plug here. Oh, OK. okay. Uh, just to notice the precision, if you imagine trying to do this on an iPad. You know, people think, oh, it's an iPad. You know, that's really easy. You know, she sort of skipped over a few things. Um, and I also want to comment, as we were talking about the architectural nature of, of Robert Helm's studio piece, um, that Linda's um, visual engineering of uh, architectural elements, historic, uh, ancient, the, if you go back and look at the crypt swimmers, if you look at the uh, pyramids, the rock walls in her paintings, they are beautifully engineered. And you can just pause and think about uh, the mathematical genius that she has, that she's able to draw and paint those the way she has, the floors, everything. Well, thank you. And you can buy these. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coyote on the move, up for breakfast, lunch, or dinner from uh, Discovery Park. During COVID, uh, the... These fancy people, uh, they started growing chickens, or raising chickens. <laughs> you don't grow them, do you? And uh, the, uh, yeah, so he looks a lot better than the coyotes out at Fort Warden. Just a lot better. Now we're moving into a new area, aren't we? We are. This is a transition. So here we have my table with all the things that I like so much, the spotted French, uh, shrimp, uh, the spotted shrimp from the Hood Canal, and the seedy bread, and the nice cheese, the sunflowers from the garden, a uh, fruit ready to be eaten, the uh, little vase from Vance of Picasso. At, when I got that, you could actually buy those pretty inexpensively. <laughs> Some yarrow stuck in there that's kind of a spiritual thing, a little robin egg, a glass of water, and my business card at the back. 
And uh, yeah, two nudes. I, I think I need to bring that out now. And then the nude here, she's kind of uh, as if she just quickly looked over her shoulder. Oh, somebody came into the room. And so there's a sensuality um, of just uh, relaxing and thinking about uh, enjoying these things. And the magpie comes in from a sketch that I did of uh, Goya's magpie, the red boy, at the mat. And um, he has a twine around his leg, and the red boy has a hold of that. And that was the way that they were handled, uh, a sort of a, a symbol of innocence and the pet uh, being uh, the child's plaything and the cats back there. Like, ah! I love that painting. They're like, oh yeah, <laughs> the bird is there. So it's just kind of an enjoyable piece, but it has a, a bit of a story to tell. And then we have vacation, uh, thinking about uh, just taking a vacation, and that's probably the closest I could come to it was painting a picture of it. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, I was thinking of Goya's nude Mata from uh, uh, the Prado, and um, I liked that pose that she had, and she was, oh, uh, this was an outrage that, to show the pubic hair, and um, so she was put into isolation for quite a number of years. But in 1930, when she came out, Spain made a stamp of her because they were so proud that they could bring her back out and send her around with her pubic hair. You know, you know. But if she came to the United States, they sent that mail back. <laughs> In 1930, yeah, she was not acceptable in the U.S. So they needed to learn about that. Now, um, I have to, I'll just introduce to you um, that if you, uh, I have one of these up in the gallery in a little drawer, that this is my uh, wand, and this relates to Goethe's chromatic lessons, or the theory of color, but he never really had a theory. These were all chromatic lessons developed especially for painters. And if you look at my paintings like this, that's how you're supposed to do it, to do it for Goethe. Goethe. You look at the paintings like this, and that's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you have to observe it in your mind and make note of it. Oh, how is this one different from that one? Different from that one. Oh, oh, I get it. I'm kind of getting it. Did I get it? You know, well, anyway, I uh, studied Goethe's theory of color. There was no theory. And I was supposed to write my <laughs> thesis on it. They were observations. Uh, there's a longer story to this. Obviously, you'd be here way too long, but it's an interesting story. And Goethe says, yeah, Newton, he took this, and he shined the light on it, and then you got all the color coming out of it. And people think that's what color is about. I know so much more about it than, than he does. <laughs> And so pay attention. <laughs> well, so the activated patterning up there, that's from what I learned about Goethe's chromatic lesson and the patterning down there and the way that I place things. So it's the interstices. In other words, <laughs> Monet painting the haystacks. It wasn't Monet painting the haystacks, but it was the space between that he painted them at different times. That was that was what it was about. Well, I'm I'm getting I'm going off track here, I know. But I wanted you to 
think about this and if you have a chance and I'm going to come back and study my paintings um, as I can because I thought I could do this on screen but there's too much interference so I have to come back to the uh, to the gallery and uh, choose some to paint the image looking through the, the prism uh, to take it further. But you can see these girls are just here having a relaxing afternoon and that was what I was imagining and it helped me to feel that when in fact I was staying in the lines painting pictures. <laughs> So these um, first two paintings around eroticism uh, are a lot about seduction and anticipation and the ambiguity of what might happen or the tantalizing possibilities. Oh, yeah. Well, here's Fire Inside the Heart. Uh, the painting down here is Le Pic Nique by Eric Satie, and I listened to that. And those were just uh, little pieces that were supposed to be um, sort of inconsequential, just little pieces, an interlude between major things. And so this is sort of just a, an interlude between things. She's, and I didn't realize until looking at it this way that she's kind of the Bluma figure, she's a spirit figure. Uh, she's carrying the spirit of herself within within this whole thing. She's hugging uh, the Basinji, the lost dog of the childhood. Uh, she has the little interlude of music that's a little nothing. But uh, she's all heated up with these fires that I, they take on the shape of hands. And I didn't even realize that when I was painting it. And uh, the hands, the hands are there. And she's being held by the hands, and the music is there. Uh, the guitar with the, the music giving life to the whole thing. And so, uh, and the tree is, is so, oh, well, it's kind of like, uh, uh, it has fruit on it. It's kind of like uh, the forbidden fruit in a way. And uh, so it's very active. It's layered up. Uh, there's some collage. The tree is layered on there. Um, uh, at least part of it. Does that, anything you'd like to say about that? I liked what you said. <laughs> it's a complicated work. Yeah. It bears uh, time. But they are in the sky. And they are floating and dancing and... Um, on fire together. So it's very passionate. It's a very passionate painting, but there's a calm to it and the way he holds her and the music and the guitar, there's a possibility of more. And um, I think it's, it's a gorgeous painting about love. But you mentioned that it's Bluma. Well, I, I you know, it's like, why is she blue? And then I, 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 realized that uh, the Bluma ghost of mother uh, was the way that appeared in a dream when she reached out with her hand and touched my hand in the dream. And uh, it was right after uh, Greg had uh, told me that they had chosen me to have this retrospective to uh, honor the 10 uh, year anniversary. And I really could, uh, that was, such a shock of kind of hard to imagine and I was pretty frightened because I had just seen uh, Jenny Ruffner's show and I was like oh <laughs> this is uh... and th then that dream my mother reached out and touched me and said I'm so proud of you and I thought oh that felt real I'm going to do a painting of it so that it has that reality of, of uh, I can look at it and I can have that feeling again. And so I did the Bluma, but here I see that this figure is blue. And so, so I thought, oh, well, she's probably a spirit figure too who's filling up herself with a sense of love. 
and comfort uh, with all these things that uh, create that, uh, that warmth and that feeling at that time. And her pose is beautiful. Yeah, it's kind of a, a, a figure eight, isn't it? A, a, mm -hmm. a, it's kind of that, a, that kind of movement. Oh, and here we have Lady of the Locks. Well, the locks were part of my Briarcliff series. And um, that, this one is a painting, uh, an iPad painting, uh, and a watercolor uh, over the top. And it's so easy for me to do that because I make sure that I don't use any filters with my iPad painting so it's as close to my hand and movement as possible. So when I go back to paint, it's like, oh, this is so easy. This is the movement of my hand. I haven't added anything that's other than my hand and my choices. And so here we have uh, not this, um, well, it's a lonely figure. She's gone down these steps. She's up against the wall, and she's reflecting on something, some uh, maybe looking for uh, uh, comfort or uh, just uh, what it means to be uh, alone uh, with herself or, or maybe thinking of... Uh, and then at the locks, you know, it, the boats come in and they go from one level uh, to another level. So it's a, a, a transition, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the only place where that can happen. And the structures of the steps and all the cement is part of the containment of that in order for it to happen. So it's an interesting contrast here between the water and the built environment. I think, though, that this figure can be interpreted in a number of ways. And certainly, she's a beautiful Matisse-like outline of a nude, but in, in a place where most of us would not be at night without any clothes. So I mean, <laughs> it's really, uh, there's a sense of isolation and, and discomfort. And I think, you know, as we talked about, you know, there are these risks to passion. There are these risks to eroticism. The, the sense of uh, isolation that can come through loss. Yeah, it's good to just paint pictures of it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, now we're moving yet into another sphere, aren't we? We are. So... Um, do you want to set the stage for these? Well, um, this was uh, the night of the volcano. And um, I was sleeping outdoors with two girlfriends who came from Port Townsend. And, uh, well, it was May 17th, 1980. So that's kind of early be, to be sleeping outdoors in the Palouse. I don't know what we were up to, really. But um, I was already pretty agitated, kind of like Apollo running in the field, where you know something's up. You can feel the energy. There was My mouth felt kind of metallic, and I knew something was up. But we, we got our set up, and... Uh, then, in the middle of the night, I saw hundreds of these shimmering white shapes over the hillsides, and their mouths were agape, moving. And it looked like they were saying, Dad, Dad, Dad. You know, I mean, I just kept looking. I didn't turn away. It was like, this is pretty interesting. It's so weird. And then the rail, uh, the, the train was there, and it probably came by. Oh, I painted this in 93, so this is a, a remembrance. Um, and there was a dream related to it that had the gate and then the serpent kind of thing. So I thought, well, I better just go ahead and paint it. I hadn't 
Um, and why not? You know, so I painted that. And then um, Well, Lisa pointed out, you know, this is kind of, I don't really get this. It's kind of fuzzy or whatever. I didn't know what she was talking about. But she said, this other one seems much more resolved. And isn't it the same thing? And again, I thought, what do you mean? Uh, but then when I thought about it, well, they do. They are related. Well, uh, the figures on the ground, uh, she asked, well, what might those be? And it was like, well, we are spiritual being, beings given opportunity to be human. And that's sort of where uh, that comes from. We, we're all spiritual beings with this human opportunity to do all these things we want to do, so make the best of it. And then the, the stream that goes by, and then that erratic is a little bit like the volcano. And then the northern lights, that's what this is called. Well, the northern lights are kind of like the ash blow, only much lighter without the particulate matter, uh, but a little bit of particulate matter because that's what causes or uh, allows the northern lights. And then up at the very top, one of the little ghost-like forms at the very top. Now, I didn't think anything about that. I, w I didn't... Uh, when I was painting this, I didn't know that there was any part that I was referencing back to the volcano. And then, of course, uh, in the morning, we were covered with ash in uh, Pullman, and it was a rather apocalyptic uh, situation. Uh, I mean, it, it looked bad to me, and I had been up all night, and I was very agitated before. So uh, the volcano really broke me. Um, I grew up uh, after my mother's death with Norma, who was born in 1898. And um, the only thing she read was the Bible. And she quoted it a lot, mostly from Revelation. And she loved the apocalyptic vision. And she didn't, uh, she didn't hesitate to share that with me when I was out trying to raise some money to do Girl Scouts and, and, and had cut up newspaper with a belt and going around door to door, you know. And uh, I earned quite a bit of money. <laughs> and she said, were you wearing underpants? I said, oh, no, that would have caught the paper and made a mess of it. And she said, you go out and get a keen switch. And then she says, those hurt, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, the fiery furnace was a big thing for for Grandma Davis, and, and it was a little scary for me when, when some people dropped acid on me in the Chinese restaurant in San Francisco, and I didn't know anything about it, and we had to drive all the way to... <laughs> San Anselmo to Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. <laughs> That was the that was the difficult time. <laughs> I'm diverging here a little bit. Uh, these are the best detours you've done in our entire time of talking about this. So um, the next painting was painted in 1980. Uh, was it? I'm not sure. Oh no, you're going to show us this oh, first. Oh yeah. Well, once in a while I run across pictures like this, and I go. Oh, some other people saw some things like this. And then I read about the old man. Well, I just like to sit on my porch out here by the marsh, and I might see a will-o'-the-wisp, and I haven't yet, but you know, it might happen. So I just sit out here and have a little drink and relax in the evening. And I thought, well, yeah, look. And then there's the snake there, too. And look, the arch is there. And oh, we're on the same page, you know. And then then I ran across Theor 
Theora Hamlet's The Vision uh, when I was visiting MoMA for the, uh, the Red Studio drawing, painting. And look, there, she's having a vision that goes like that. And she was at the same place. And so, Lisa, can you tell me where those things are stored in my... Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> But, but I do think this was reassuring for you to see that other people were seeing the same things that you had seen. Yeah, it was and like, really, you know. And that, that it was worth putting into your paintings after all. It was yeah, the best yeah, thing, Yeah, right? because somebody else might need them in the future, yeah. you know. <laughs> so this is the painting that you did after the volcano in the same year, and I don't know how long after that that you did that. I don't know either, but it was that same year. And Miles, my son, who was uh, uh, six at that time, he did a lot of really beautiful volcano paintings, and he sort of influenced me on this because I really liked his volcano paintings. And I, I put one up on my Facebook page if you happen to check that out. Um, but anyway, so the volc I was, this is birds of a feather fall together. And um, E equals MC squared. Well, you know, I was, I was into Einstein. I liked to have somebody read his theory of relativity to me when I was about 12. And I'd, I, and I'd go, read it again, that part. Because if you have it read to you, you can visualize uh, the train and this and that happening. And I, I remember just laughing and going, oh, that is so cool. I can't recall it to you now. I need to go back and read. But I loved having that read to me. So equals MC squared just totally, was, totally came to mind with the volcano. And I won't get into all the stuff because it would get too long. But the white and the red, that's a combination that you see in uh, the, the Frida, I, uh, letter to Frida. You see it in the hunger artist. And, um, and another one that I can't think of at the moment. But I want to go back and study those with my, with my prism to see if I can find out what was the emotion that I experienced with that compositional combination. Because up here with the E, you see that circular thing of uh, the color wheel that was referenced, Goethe's color wheel, um, from the chromatic lessons. And um, with each of those colors, then there's an associated um, emotional response. And so you can study that with your own work. Like what does, when I'm using this, what am I feeling? You know, try to make connections for yourself within that realm and make notes. And um, so I, I, and also with the volcano, when you looked at pictures, it was like how many animals lost their lives? How many birds were, what, what and all the, trees just laid out flat and um yeah so it was very cataclysmic and very dramatic and dramatic for me it it broke me i knew that i had to leave the palouse where i had been for a decade and um my marriage was falling apart and i fell apart and um I didn't have any language to put it back together. And so I went uh, to the end of the world, which was Port Townsend. Because, <laughs> you know, then the Hood Canal Bridge was out. You had to take the low fall, and then you had to take the other. What was the other one? The roadie? Oh, well, the one from, uh, anyway. There were yeah. two ferries, and uh, and so it was. It was definitely, you know, I felt like I was really in a remote place, and it was, and uh, that was in uh, 1980. So music is the muse. This is. Um,
Well, I remember you said, this is kind of what your brain looks like, isn't it, Linda? I don't think I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I did not say that. <laughs> but it was like, oh, that is so perfect. I should just make this in the shape of a head and put it on me, and that would be perfect. Uh, so yeah, this is like, what do we see here in the middle is uh, a scene from Streetcar Named Desire, one of my favorite uh, works. And uh, certainly, if it were showing anywhere, I would go to see uh, Streetcar, whether it was amateur theater or anything else. I love uh, uh, people's interpretation of that. And I think that Seeing Streetcar Named Desire, I was either, I, I, I think I might have been, maybe nine years old in the theater in the little town where I lived. It was kind of like um, the last picture show, that place. And um, when Blanche is out at Moon Lake Casino, there's a shot. And she kind of, oh, oh. Her man that she was in love with had, had killed himself. And then the music that's playing was the same music that was in my mother's music box. And so I think I had my first collapse at that time when I saw a streetcar named Desire. I think that I realized that I had experienced that. And that Blanche, here with the men in the alcove and, and that center thing of the water, uh, uh, the uh, in the plaza place, that's something that has been repeated in my paintings quite a number of times. Um, and then she's at the railing, uh, and they say, uh, what's the matter, lady? And um, so it was a, a poignant moment where uh, you knew something was going to happen. And so these things are collaged together. The water coming out of the rock is kind of like a miracle. But in my poem, in the poetry of uh, Nine Notes and Visions, I have water or rock, and its beautiful form is water. So I don't know if there was something in the Bible where you strike a rock and water comes out. I'm going to have to look for that. It was something... Um, I haven't read the Bible in a long time, but there are phrases that come up. And then, uh, then things are burned and falling down. And so the work up above is work that I had worked on uh, for uh, two years. And I decided that I would burn it and then put it up, glue it onto there. And then there's the sheet music for all we know that's uh, I, those I've written out and put on there. And so when Miles played this music uh, on Friday night, I had never heard the music with he, in that way. And so I'm looking forward to being able to go back and revisit his video of playing those things because he brought out certain parts that had an authenticity uh, the way that jazz musicians, what they can do, they have a, a bent for authenticity that sometimes is a bit uncomfortable, and uh, but meaningful, you know, if you can go there and pay attention. And so uh, I was very moved by his performance and uh, uh, kind of lost myself a bit in in that. Uh, in that passage, I didn't know I had as many uh, uh, paintings with music related as what he uh, presented with his uh, uh, performance. 
and uh, the water and the flames. Again, the flames are a bit like hands, the, the raven or the crow flying by. There's, uh, there's just, and the Palouse Hills. Yes, the Palouse Hills are there. So this is a sort of where these things are coming together and maybe I'm putting them aside. I don't know for sure, but it, it feels like that. And I don't know that I've ever exhibited this piece. It's a very private piece. And so sometimes works aren't made for the public. You know, they really aren't. I, I had no intention of showing the death of mother pieces, but a number of people talked to me and said, you know, it's kind of like Edward Munch said, my life was, uh, was filled with uh, disaster and, and illness and tragedy. But it informs so much of my work, I'm not sure that I would remove it from my life. And um, so I, I think it's probably, and I thought, well, I'm 76 now. Um, I should tell my story as best I can. And uh, if it brings something to you, then um, this is my best opportunity to do that. And so I went along with their uh, um, suggestions, and, uh, and Bima so kindly uh, uh, framed those and took care of, uh, of other things as well. So I'm deeply grateful for that. Uh, contribu uh, contribution both intellectually and curatorial uh, work and uh, all of those different parts that have truly made me see things in a different light. Do you have anything about this? That, that was beautiful. Oh, that was you. beautiful, Minda. So um, this last piece is uh, the same piece we ended the last program with. And so it's a chance to reflect on it from a different vantage point. I don't remember what I said before, but... I don't, I don't either. <laughs> so I worked on this piece from January 2018 until August 2023. It had to go through quite a curatorial process for me because I needed to make sure that each bird was really mine, that it wasn't a cut and paste like you'll see the the blue bird up there, he's in an early painting of memory fades, standing as kind of a guard against the bed. And the, the, the yellow bird up there was in the very first monkey shine painting. And the hoopoe is the one in Conference of the Birds, the 12th century um, uh, Persian uh, poem, epic poem, um, by Farid Attar. Um, and and the magpies from Eastern Washington, the herons that always pose so perfectly out at Chinese gardens across they they pick the they pay attention to how the <laughs> they've got it you know they're just like I look good here <laughs> yeah and uh, and then the the bluebirds and. Uh, so I was really careful about uh, making sure that I had uh, a feeling connection to each of these coming back into this scene. And the white raven uh, that I identify with uh, is seen up on the Vancouver Island, and it has a, a you know a genetic. Um, irregularity that makes it white. And so I identify with it because I have uh, have had the vitiligo uh, that was partly uh, uh, some of that happened from the downwinder thing. And so I too, I, I could never live in Hawaii or places with too much solar. I'm kind of, I am ideally located where in, <laughs> yeah, you know. 
<laughs> and so these, uh, they became my friends, but the White Raven interviewed um, each of these to see if they would go on the long journey, the long flight. And so I realized I was trying to write kind of an operetta because the White Raven uh, talked to the Black Raven and said, well, do you think you could go on this journey? And the Black Raven uh, responded, caw, caw, caw. We look for paths from anger to courage. Yes, I, I think so. And then White Raven asked the little yellow bird, and do you, can you go on this long line? And the yellow bird says, well, I just kind of like flitting around. <laughs> and, but I see that the little yellow bird did make it in there, so maybe, you know. <laughs> and then uh, White Raven asks the owl, and the owl goes, whoop, whoop, whoo. Danger is protection. That was something from a dream, and I, okay, you know. So they went. And then, the reason it took so long from 2018 to 2023 was I had to get a new shoulder. And COVID happened, and they had been in the Valley of Love in Dreamland because, um, I thought that hope was what we needed most during uh, COVID. And so that was going to be my focus. And hope is also what we most need uh, during breast cancer. And I had had breast cancer twice. And so hope was my, um, my mantra. And so when I was getting my new shoulder that worked so well, and, oh, it was painful. I couldn't move that shoulder, but I could do iPad. Uh, I could use small muscles. So I worked through all these permutations of variations to, uh, I would never have spent so much time on composition, but I had that time and I could do it, so I did it. And then when I went into the surgical room, I saw all those people there with all their things, the special things that they were doing with Dr. Winston Warm at UW, and I went, dangerous protection. This is a dangerous situation, and these guys are all protecting me, so I introduced myself to each one and thanked them for being there for me. And then I finished that, the birds take flight. Uh, it wasn't in the final form because it was nighttime, and later I realized it wasn't night when they were flying. I don't know where birds go at night, but I don't think they're on those long <laughs> journeys. So, <laughs> so I sent that series to all of those uh, uh, people who were uh, uh, studying with Dr. Winston Warm, and he said, well, they all flew away just yesterday. And, but I'll make sure they each get one. And I said, oh, thank you, thank you. And so that was where the first edition went, but those guys were all black. So I am, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm being honest about my editions. Uh, so they take off and they're going to this remarkable place that I have lots of notes on, but it's what I get to go back to since I've spent two years working on this retrospective because I had to go from slides to floppy disks to thumb drives to uh, what were all the things in different computers and, you know, so there was a lot of uh, stuff. And now I'm uh, going to head to the studio with new enthusiasm and back to my... Uh, song and meditation practice and hopefully helping out in the garden a little bit. And um, so I want to thank all of you for uh, being here and uh, uh, the BEMA staff and Greg Robinson for this beautiful curatorial work and uh, so many people who just uh, 
stepped up and helped me in every way possible to make this a beautiful, wonderful, and discovery-finding opportunity for me that would never have happened otherwise. And thank you, Lisa, most of all. I would never have been able to organize all this material without Lisa. Yeah, yeah. That was one place that I was really lacking was any uh, organizational uh, abilities. They were uh, all these papers were in stacks, and she said, "You know, you could get boxes and and <laughs> label the boxes." And I did that, and then. And now those boxes, you could put those in stacks. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so it was kind of like those uh, hay bales out on the Palouse that when I drove through there in September, they were taking shapes of like a pyramid, those hay bales, and loaves of bread. I mean, people were getting fanciful with their <laughs> stacks. And I got fanciful with them because... Lisa helped me all along the way of how to, how to cut through uh, all of that chaos. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions if anybody would, would like to ask. Any questions of Linda or Lisa? Oh, I'd like to say, um, before we do any Q&A, if anybody needs to catch a ferry, that they are, uh, I know about this business, <laughs> and needing to uh, be uh, at that time. So if anybody needs to leave because of that, please feel invited to do so. Any questions? Yeah. I just had a comment. I wanted to say thank you for drawing so many magpies. They're one of my favorite birds. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And the hoopoe is the leader in that original referenced Conference of the Birds, and I started Conference of the Birds in 1999 when dear um, um, our jazz uh, teacher uh, taught us the fuguing tune of Conference of the Birds from Dave Holland's uh, CD. Well, um, my oldest son, Miles, uh, is a jazz musician, and um, I love listening to music, and I don't have any uh, particular talent in that way, but I have a, a good ear. And so now, well, when you see the uh, up in the gallery, there'll be, uh, there's uh, three calligraphic uh, things that I did for his, uh, uh, trickster album live uh, in Brooklyn and I had asked my uh, granddaughter Arya who's nine at the time could you I, I'm trying to get a few questions from people about my work and could you think of a question uh, to, to uh, give to me and so a while passed and then I came back and and she said yeah what was the hardest painting you did and what was the easiest painting you did and I was just kind of, uh, momentarily, I was just kind of disappointed. I, I thought, you know, and then I thought, oh, she's brilliant. This was the hardest painting I did. And then the, the, the calligraphic things for the album were the easiest. And what happened was he wanted me to go through and listen to the rough and make some notes. And so uh, I was listening to the rough before mixing, and then I was... Uh, doing the calligraphic ink and with my eyes open and going through it about three times that way. And then I thought, well, why don't you try with your eyes closed? 
And I had all these pieces of paper that I, and so then I was doing it, and going back and going. And so I, I spent the day, or, you know, a few hours doing that, listening. The, the tapes were probably a little more than an hour or so. And the, the ones with my eyes closed are the ones upstairs. And I really, I, I was like, oh, I like this, you know. And so maybe it'll be something that I can explore in the future. But uh, yeah, it felt great doing that. Yeah. So when you have these visions and um, images and messages in your dream, what, what is your procedure when you wake up? Oh, pardon? What is the procedure you have when you wake up? Oh, um, well, I, I did it very conscientiously back in the 80s and have quite a number of drawings and sketches from that time. Uh, so it was a, a, a process of lucid dream uh, and they probably have methodologies out there now of all kinds of places that teach you lucid dreaming uh, techniques. So I try to make notes as fast as I can. And now that I have the iPad, it's even easier because I don't have to set up all the paint and all that stuff. And I can just make some quick notations upon waking. So it is a practice in order to sustain the authenticity. Or you can have a notepad or something by your bed if. Uh, you find you can't uh, uh, keep it in, until the morning, so. Back here. Hi. Yes. Um, can you talk a little, I've seen uh, this location in this painting is on two of the paintings that are shown in the gallery. Is this a specific place in your mind? Oh. Right? Can you talk about that? Uh, yes, thank you for mentioning that. Um, and it's also on the cover of uh, the little chapbook of Nine Notes and Visions that was a, 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 like a poetry book that's uh, also available. Um, that, that background was from a dream at Salt Creek from 1999, I believe. And it became the backdrop like a stage set. So that's how I began to realize that I was trying to work on a, a little operetta or something, that that's the backdrop. And then all these things happen in that stage. So, uh, so yes, that's the stage that is kind of a dreamscape from that time of uh, the dream at Salt Creek, which was that uh, artists for everyone uh, teach people how to tell their story. Where is Salt Creek? Oh, it's over there. Uh, west of Port Angeles. A very lovely place to go. Okay, should we go get some refreshments? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>